Hello, this is Gibson Shamar from Hikati Media. In this video, we're going to talk about the Book of Boba Fett. The Book of Boba Fett, teased at the end of Mandalorian Season 2 and poised to explore the life of bad I mean fan favorite bounty hunter Boba Fett with his trusty sidekick, I mean partner, secretary, slash bodyguard, slash right hand Fennec Shand, who has been very well preserved because it looks like she's supposed to be the same age as Obi-Wan or Anakin because, well, she was clearly an adult when she went after the Bad Batch in 18 BBY. Anyway, let's get back to the Book of Boba Fett. Let's get to the usual formula and, well, we'll see how it goes from there, shall we? Let's start with Boba Fett. He's a bounty hunter who was under the employ of the Empire and tasked with finding the Millennium Falcon and tasked by Jabba the Hutt to capture Solo. He did both and then got taken out by Han by mistake and fell into the Sarlacc pit. It even burped after he fell in. <laughs> now, fans didn't like that. This really cool looking bounty hunter with a mask on at all times that probably has a maximum of five lines throughout the original trilogy was killed off so unceremoniously. Apparently, George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars himself, didn't know that Boba was loved by fans so much, but you know, he was dead. It was done. So, you know, you're only done as long as it's you. It doesn't matter if you're the creator of the universe, as long as it's not you, people will undo or recontextualize everything you established, as long as it aligns with the fan desires and fan wishes. It doesn't matter if it aligns to the story or not, as long as you provide an excuse, sorry, reason for it. it doesn't even have to be good, it just has to be a reason. Anyway, Boba Fett got out of the pit and decided that it's time to take control of Tatooine's criminal underworld and Fennec Shan joins him. He chooses to earn his place with respect instead of fear. Fair enough. Boba, as a character, had a blank slate to go off of. They could go anywhere with him because there wasn't much about him in the original movies. He was just a cool looking bounty hunter. The show got more into his human side, his soft side, his sensitive side. He was also explored far more than I thought he would be, and the show did a good job of breaking Boba down like that to help us get in tune with him. The problem was that it wasn't the kind of show fans expected. He's far too sensitive, passive, and forgiving. Even when given the chance to assert dominance, he chooses to sit back and spare as many lives as possible. That's not the Boba we know from the past. His arc wasn't properly defined. He had an objective, but no arc. Nothing about him changed throughout the show. The changes took place in flashbacks. He doesn't act like a bounty hunter or even a crime boss and keeps adding this unnecessary gravel to his voice. His normal voice is okay. I don't know why he has to do that. And as much as he's looked at as the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy, this show didn't really show why he has that reputation. Then we have Fennec Shand, his trusty sidekick partner who runs the show, handles everything Boba doesn't want to do himself, occasionally giving him good advice, which he ignores more often than not, and basically has a bigger body count than the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy. At least in this show. She's a dead serious person. Intense, observant, cold, calculating, loyal, fearless, dedicated. And she has a pretty good idea of how to achieve the goal Boba has set up for himself. While she fulfills her role very well, it feels like she's overlooked even though I can't really show any evidence of that. Fennec, just like Boba, was... A blank slate in this show. 
there were infinite places it could have gone with her, and, well, it didn't. We at least got to see her kick butt the Ming Na Wen way. Uh, she was very good at what she did. I do have questions about her motivations in the show, though. When they talked about why she was with Boba and Mando too, it seemed like she joined him out of loyalty due to how cool he is. But the show shows us that she just joined him because she had nothing better to do at the time. It wasn't some oath she swore, he didn't earn her respect, she didn't get convinced by his ability to handle himself. She just joined him because she felt like it. Pretty cool if you ask me. I mean, it was all well thought out from the start, right? Right. There couldn't have been better ways of explaining their partnership. Oh, well, I guess we can talk about the show itself now because the other characters don't even show up enough to be the main characters. Or characters worth discussing. Like I said before, or perhaps hinted at it, I'm not really sure how well y'all understood, but the thing is, this show, I came in with a certain expectation of it. I didn't really know what it was, but the show didn't really set up anything worth looking towards. For example, we're supposed to see that Boba Fett is this really intense guy, you know, he's a badass bounty hunter and all of that, but we don't really get to see any of that explored properly even when he's trying to take over a crime-ridden town. For example, missed opportunity number one. The mayor's aide came to his place, showed him disrespect, and he spared his life. He didn't kill him. In fact, he didn't send a message to the mayor at all. Missed opportunity number two. He showed up to the town and wasn't treated like a noble. He didn't want to be treated like a noble. He could have showed up in a convoy, but didn't. He just came there on foot. Even Fennec Shan found that weird. The convoy wasn't supposed to show that he's better than everyone, it was just to show power and dominance. Missed opportunity number three, he walks into a place that's supposed to be paying him tribute, and he was told to wait there because the owner of the place wasn't ready to see him. And he just was like, okay, cool, I'll wait here. Now, if I wanted respect, at least in the criminal underworld, I wouldn't accept that. I would demand to be attended to immediately. Missed opportunity number four, he captures his would-be assassin but doesn't kill him or slowly kill him or torture him. He just lets him go. And the weird thing is, the weirdest thing is at least, that these were all in the first episode. The episode that's supposed to show the tone of the whole show. The episode that's supposed to show us what Boba Fett is going to be like. And it's very lackluster in that way. Because... It just shows that he's a passive guy. The show starts with him having a little bit of trouble, but then somehow slowly getting the respect of people. And then a new crime syndicate shows up and they want to start their drug running operation on Tatooine. While they started somewhere else, they just wanted to add Tatooine to their list of territories. Because, well, Jabba the Hutt was dead and there was a power vacuum which Boba was still failing to fill. And that's where the main fight of the show is. See, if I were some sort of crime lord aspirant or a guy aspiring to be a crime lord in a place, I wouldn't prohibit other people from committing crimes in the place. I'd tell them, guys, run rampant, just do it in the way that I allow you to and you pay me tribute. But this guy who's aspiring to be a crime lord seems to be more willing to eradicate crime and drug running in his town. So what exactly are you going to be doing as a crime lord? What exactly is your objective, pal? Because I really don't get it. And the funniest thing is there's always that look that Fennec Shand gives him. That goes like, bro, I see what you're doing, but I don't think that this is the right way to go about it. But heck. You're the one doing it. I'll just let you be. And, you know, it's just bizarre that the side character actually knows better than the main character about what the main character is trying to do. I know that's a common trope in all of these things, but Boba Fett is often treated as right for doing these things by the show. None of what he does actually backfires on him properly. At least not in the way that it's supposed to change his whole outlook 
on the situation. And for the life of me, I really would enjoy a storyline where Fennec Shand actually backstabs this guy and takes over everything as Daimyo, or however you say it. He kind of pronounces that word differently in every episode. But anyway, it would be really cool if Fennec Shand actually betrayed him in the future seasons. I know they're not going to go down that road, but it would really be a nice story. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to root for Fennec because, well, she's basically what Boba Fett was expected to be by the fans. The show's pacing is... I wouldn't say slow, it's just kind of disorganized. Because it's got good development, it shows us his backstory, it shows us why he changed his ways and became the way he is. But at the same time, the flashbacks that those things happen in kind of take away from the show itself, because the flashbacks are actually more interesting than what's happening in the present. I don't know what exactly went into the production of this show. I don't know what the idea was behind this show, but it was definitely set in the wrong time period. And the funniest thing is, the worst thing about it is that there was no real way you could do it differently because it's a spin-off from Mandalorian where he already has Fennec Shand with him, where he's already out of the Sarlacc pit. And he already has his armor back as well. We know how he loses it and everything. So this show was put in a very difficult position of trying to balance the things because we do need to see how these things came into fruition, how they played, how they developed, and how things just ended up being the way they were in Mando season two. But at the same time, we had to push the story forward. So I don't really fault the creators for the show's pacing and its focus, but it still is their fault because it's all set in the Star Wars universe confined to being the Mandoverse, I guess. That's what people are calling it these days. So if you have like a universe set out, you've kind of planned out what you're going to be releasing and doing. You're not just going to be making things up as you go along. And seriously, I just have to take a break from this because we have to talk about the two episodes which were weird. The ones that focused on Din Djarin's Mandalorian. I don't know what the reason was for including those two episodes in the Book of Boba Fett. And I really don't want to know what the behind the scenes politics were regarding that decision. But it was a very bad decision, I can say. Because not only did you take away from the Book of Boba Fett, but you took away from the Mandalorian. Listen guys, you had a very good thing going by showing Din Djarin before he met Grogu and showing his growing relationship with Grogu. But if you're going to end season two so beautifully, so magically by having Grogu be taken by Luke Skywalker to be trained as a Jedi, you don't undo that in a spin-off show. I mean, it would have been better if Mando just carried on on his own and started doing more Mandalorian things, getting involved with like Bo-Katan and all of that. I understand that's what's going on now in Mando Season 3. I haven't started it yet. I'm not going to watch it for a very long time. But I will get to it eventually. The thing is, his and Grogu's journey was done. His story with Grogu was done. It was a beautiful ending. If you can't do Mandalorian without Grogu, then you should have just ended it on Season 2 because you kind of just took away from that moment. And it was just so weird how it just became Mando-focused and Jedi training-focused. And yes, we got to see more of Luke. And, well, yeah, I guess it was nice seeing young Luke again training Grogu. Or at least, you know, trying to train Grogu. You know, dump a little exposition tell Grogu all these things that the fans know from the original trilogy, like talking about Yoda and how Yoda used to speak and how interesting that was. Yeah, it was nice and all. Thanks for showing us that, guys. The most bizarre thing is that somehow Ahsoka was there as well. I don't understand why Ahsoka was there, because... If we watched that uh, Ahsoka series spin-off advert in Mando Season 2, 
that episode called The Jedi, and it was supposed to be referring to Ahsoka, but she's not a Jedi, according to everyone who defends her survival and status throughout the original trilogy or whatever. I'm not going to get into that, but I do have a lot of questions about that, too. She was looking for Thrawn, and suddenly she's just chillaxing on whatever planet that is that Luke's on, training Grogu. You know, Din shows up because he misses Grogu. He just wants to give him a piece of armor. And then he meets Ahsoka. I guess that's where all the fans were supposed to go like, Oh, that's so cool, man. Ahsoka's there. Yeah, man. After a little conversation, she guides Din on what to do, I guess. I don't really remember what she did. Ah, yes. She takes uh, the armor and goes and gives it to Luke. Her conversation with Luke was also one of those moments which was supposed to break the internet because Luke Skywalker is meeting Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka was Anakin's Padawan in the Clone Wars, man. This is just so cool that they're finally meeting. So epic. But no, it wasn't. It really wasn't. Seriously. It was just planned. It was there. And their interaction with each other was so weird. It felt like so forced. Like whatever they were saying, it felt like they were just saying it so that they could kill the awkward silence there was there. If I remember correctly, it was like, they talk. And then somebody else talks. And then somebody else talks. And then somebody else talks. You know, like that. It was just so weird and jarring. I was like, okay, guys, say something. Talk. Don't just look at each other. Don't. Don't. Just talk. Please. Stop being quiet. Stop giving pauses in between your verbal exchanges. Like, say something. And then, of course, the most generic piece of dialogue there was. You know how Ahsoka, every time she shows up, it feels like every time she shows up, she always finds a vague reference to Anakin Skywalker that she's supposed to bring up so the audience can go like, oh yeah, she's referring to Anakin Skywalker in this. I mean, she's talking to the Mandalorian and then she's talking about how she knew a guy that was consumed by anger. It took over him. Like, what the heck is going on here? We know you were Anakin's Padawan. You don't have to bring him up every time you meet somebody. You know? And then even here, she says the most predictable generic line I could possibly think of her saying. And somehow I knew she was going to say it. So much like your father. It doesn't get any more generic than that, pals. Even if it comes from absolutely nowhere. As long as it's Ahsoka saying something, it's nice. Because, you know, it's a reference to Anakin Skywalker. To Luke Skywalker. You know, it's like poetry. It rhymes. <laughs> and then she just takes off into her own spin-off show because she remembered that she's supposed to be out looking for Thrawn. Even the meta comment by Luke when he asks her if he's going to see her again and she's like, mm, yeah, perhaps, probably, yeah, you will. Her appearance feeling so shoved in, I was just left at the end of the episode like, what the flip why was she even in this everything she did could have been handled by luke on his own even from a writing perspective and then i watched the end credits of that episode so back to the book of boba fett or at least you know back to boba fett himself the finale that came after that featured a gun battle between a character that i really hate cad bane dang i hated that guy so much and, well, Boba, it was a final showdown that the two had, which I guess was supposed to be built up through years of rivalry that we never actually got to see or hear the reference of. Maybe, like, from behind-the-scenes decisions where seasons of the Clone Wars were supposed to deal with that, I guess, but then they didn't, and it was going to get really violent, really graphic and all of that, but never came to show, and... The show just wanted to show us the conclusion to their rivalry. Interesting. Well, Bane died. 
I cheered for that, by the way, because I really, really hated that guy. Seriously. And Boba and his list of allies, Chrysanthemum, and those uh, guys on the multicolored bikes, which kind of really ruined the aesthetic of the show with their vibrant colors and all of that. But hey, that's not up to me to decide. And well, Boba Fett is Daimyo of Tatooine. And he has finally claimed his position. So he rids the planet of the drug lords that were trying to smuggle drugs through the planet. And I guess he's the new crime lord. I don't really know what kind of crimes he's going to be lording, but I guess it's a good ending to the show. Yeah, and I guess that's all there is to say about the book of Boba Fett in this talk because there's really nothing much to talk about with the slow episodes and the low episode count and the unfocused storyline with the disorganized pacing but at least the casting was good and I just have to say I really love Rosario Dawson she's one of my celebrity crushes oh she's just so hot Man, she's so hot. Anyway, yeah, that's basically all Hikati Media has to say about the Book of Boba Fett. So that's it for this week's video, the Book of Boba Fett talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like, please comment, please subscribe to the channel, yada, yada, yada. I also have an Instagram page, Hikati underscore media. I have a Facebook page, Hikati Media. Please like it, please follow it. Check out the content we have there. And we have just opened a website as well where we'll be posting articles about different things from different shows and movies throughout history that interest us or that interest you as well. Especially you guys, the audience, people we're trying to please with entertainment and content. So check all of these things out and let us know what you think about them. Also, Please tell Ahsoka to stop looking at Luke like that because people online are going to start shipping them and it's going to get really weird after that.